I'm Andrew, US Fresh, um, A Fresh One at OpenBSD and A Fresh One most places on the internet. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, the firmware update tool and uh, how it came to be, how I came to rewrite it fairly recently. But I'm going to use that mostly to talk about uh, the way that OpenBSD prioritizes user experience and some of the uh, kind of goals that OpenBSD has in those kind of, that, that area. But before we get started, I'm gonna, the thing that uh, kind of drew, led me into doing this um, is there was some bad user experience, and that was that during an OpenBSD installation, the installer asks, do you want to start X Windows when the computer re reboots? But after reboot, X Windows didn't start. Um, you had to log in via the text console and reboot again after that happened. Uh, and, and then the next time after that, usually X would start. Um, and it's kind of uh, slightly surprising that I'm involved because my main laptop is either my X220 uh, from 2011 uh, that I've put the travel power adapter somewhere, so I'm not using it today, um, or this 2013 T44ES. Uh, and I don't reinstall those very often, so I don't run into this problem myself. Um, however, new users would definitely hit this when they uh, are installing OpenBSD for the first time or um, one of the first times. And that leads to you know bad impression. And so I kind of care about uh, people having a good experience with OpenBSD. And I knew about it because Theo, uh, the project leader, takes tests laptops a lot, um, tries out OpenBSD on all sorts of new laptops, and fairly regularly he would mention um, that this was still an issue. Uh, and I thought, well, it's only avoiding one reboot. How hard could it be, really, right? Um, we'll talk about why, how hard it is eventually. But <clears throat> first, why, why is this uh, the case? So. A long time ago, uh, manufacturers used to uh, ship their hardware uh, with the firmware on a flash chip on the device. But over time, firmware gets larger and flash chips get more expensive and manufacturers um, want to make more money. So they figured out that they could, instead of shipping a flash chip with OpenBS or with uh, the device that they're shipping, they could just ship the firmware separately and have the operating system load that firmware onto the device when it's needed. Um, there are some benefits to that, like previously to flash a new firmware onto a device, you often had to like find a Windows machine to put the device in or find a floppy drive so that you could boot off a floppy disk to flash the firmware, which is kind of gives you an idea of how long ago this was that it worked that way. Um, but now that there are two separate pieces, the hardware and the firmware, uh, they can put a separate distribution license on that firmware. Previously, you could buy a piece of hardware off of eBay and you didn't care really necessarily what the license on the firmware was because it just was there already. Um, but now that they're separate, uh, it really matters what that uh, license is. And now that that's true, a lot of people uh, care about what that license is. Um, for example, uh, Fossey tries to provide a 802.11b wireless network. Uh, and they did last year. They've had some trouble with it this year. But that's because the, uh, that, uh, those devices are, have a free software, firmware, a firmware that qualifies as free software. And so they can, people who really want to run only free software can run a device that has wireless with that. Um, now OpenBSD cares a little less, they uh, uh, a little differently about what about that because the firmware doesn't run uh, on the processor and it isn't part of the OpenBSD kernel and isn't really part of the system. It runs on this dedicated hardware that's just for it. And so what OpenBSD really cares about is whether the licensing for that firmware allows OpenBSD to distribute it without any, adding any restrictions on who can use OpenBSD or who can 
who, who, how OpenBSD can be distributed. And of course, hardware manufacturers uh, care that uh, their intellectual property is uh, protected and all sorts of uh, things. And so they often end up accidentally putting in uh, terms into their licensing that mean there are additional restrictions on how you can distribute and who you can distribute the firmware to. So we can have a conflict there. And because OpenBSD is a real stickler for licenses, um, I've got several email from folks patiently explaining to me that Perl uh, doesn't only use the DPL, um, and so it doesn't belong in the source GNU directory. And I, I got that email because well, the thing that I mostly do in OpenBSD is keep the Perl that ships in the base system up to date. Um, so I was really glad when we re redefined what GNU meant in OpenBSD, um, or what GNU meant in OpenBSD. But, so we have some things in the base system that have unacceptable licenses. Um, and, and those are things that, uh, have, that, that have generally been there for a really long time and don't have a better alternative yet as far as licensing goes. Um, and there are some things that have never been part of the OpenBSD's base system. Uh, things that we use like the CDDL license or the DPLv3 are uh, not included in the base system, even in the source GNU directory. Um, you know, and as time has gone on, those restrictions of what new things can be imported have gotten a lot more strict. Um, for example, now it's unlikely that anything new that's licensed DPL v2 will be uh, imported, even though we have uh, a lot of things that are GPL v2 and updates to that software are generally acceptable. Um, some other things other than Perl that are in there are CVS, uh, the GNU CVS. We do have an open CVS uh, licensed version of CVS, but it is not completely fully featured yet. And for some reason, there are, isn't a whole lot of uh, energy towards improving it. Um, Clang LLVM is in there for most of our architectures. And there are several uh, versions of GCC that are GPL v2. We're building on architectures that uh, Clang LLVM doesn't support. Um, so, uh, OpenBSD um, really looks at the complexity of the software and the license that it has. So, for example, and the utility it provides. Um, for example, OpenBSD has its own Wi Fi stack uh, that is not the same stack that's used by a lot of other projects um, because. I'm not sure if that one's entirely because of the complexity or the license, but uh, OpenBSD does uh, import and use the uh, DRM, the Direct Rendering Manager uh, graphic stack that Linux is the, uh, also uses. Um, and it's because it has a, I think it's an MIT license. And so there's a lot of firmware that manufacturers provide, and a lot of manufacturers provide firmware that can be included as part of the OpenBSD base system. And so when you install OpenBSD, that firmware is just there already when you, after install. Um, but there's also a lot of manufacturers that provide firmware with a much a more restrictive license on how it can be distributed. Sure, maybe. Um, the, some of the, that, light, that firmware that has that not uh, the, the, the license that can't be distributed as part of OpenBSD does have license that allows distribution in ways that open, that are just a little more restrictive than OpenBSD likes. Um, and we can uh, distribute that firmware uh, outside of the base system and provide it in a, more, in a fairly easy to install way. Um, this ends up being mostly Wi-Fi cards and graphics cards, but uh, Intel, Motherboard chipsets are also uh, commonly a problem. Now, 
just because manufacturers currently license their firmware that way doesn't mean it necessarily stays that way. Uh, for example, Realtek uh, wireless cards used to have a firmware that was that had a patent clause. I think it said something about if you have a if you use our firmware, you promise not to sue us for infringing on your patents or something like that. And uh, Keblo at OpenBSD contacted Realtek and said, "Hey, OpenBSD would really like to include your firmware and let people who uh, want to use Realtek cards uh, use them easily on OpenBSD." And somebody at Realtek said, "Oh." Well, we want people to be able to use our cards, and so they changed their license, and now the Realtek firmware is uh, part of the base system. That was actually a little bit of work on my part because uh, when it went from being a installed package to being uh, in the base, we had to unregister and say, oh, it's not a package anymore. And so there's some code in the um, tool now to do that. Unfortunately, it hasn't had a lot of testing. Because it's been really only real tech so far. So if you know somebody who uh, can talk to the right people at a company that or something that ha that's providing firmware that's a wrong license, I would really like to test out this um, code these code paths a little more and move a lot more firmware from these packages into the base system. So let's jump back again and go into a little bit of how this changed. So manufacturers started uh, moving this firmware off of their uh, off of the flash chips and into the making the OS do it. But we still want to, uh, people to be able to run OpenBSD on modern hardware. We don't want to be stuck uh, running really old hardware, even though I mostly do. Um, but <clears throat> people also need to be able to use OpenBSD for whatever they want. And that's one of the goals of the project is to provide a system that uh, can be used for anything. And maybe some of those people can't agree to some of those license terms. Like, you know, they, they don't want to say, yes, uh, I agree not to sue you for violating my patents, but I don't actually have any patents. So I'm, I'm fine saying I will use um, a card that lets me, or I, I'm fine using your hardware and I. You probably won't violate my, or I pro you probably will not violate my patents, so I will not sue you for that. And so, the rest of us that can accept those terms don't need to suffer without using that hardware. We can use it because we will accept those licenses. And the few people that uh, don't want to are more limited in their choices. Now, because OpenBSD doesn't uh, just say use it, doesn't just use it anyway. Say Oh, this th this firmware doesn't have a license that uh, is acceptable to be part of the base system, but probably nobody will ever notice and nobody will ever like complain about it. So we'll just import it anyway and use it. And they don't say that. That's not something that uh, OpenBST is going to do. And so if that if if the firmware is, doesn't have an acceptable license, then the hardware just isn't supported. Um, and this, of course, leads to suffering, like uh, the. Uh, NVIDIA video cards uh, don't provide good, good documentation for their hardware, and so OpenBSD doesn't have any support for NVIDIA um, anything pretty much. So, like I said, we figured out that these firmware that were uh, that kind of middle ground of licensing. Um, We could make people go download the Windows driver, extract the firmware from, from it, and then stick it into the right directory and hope it works, or uh, find some website somewhere on GitHub that has the firmware that might or may not be official, or who knows what. Um, and that's not a really good user interface. And so instead, the, those firmware that have that kind of middle ground license became part of the ports and package tree. And so all you had to do was <clears throat> look in your D message for what hardware the, the kernel saw, know that, oh, that piece of hardware needs a firmware that's not uh, part of the base system, 
figure out what the name of the package was and install it. Well, that was easier than trying to find the firmware somewhere on the internet, but it was still not super easy. So shortly, right at, shortly after that, uh, Halex at OpenBSD wrote the first version of firmware update. Um, and all it did was look in that D message, figure out what devices needed firmware, and call package add to install those packages. And so it embedded that knowledge that used to be a little bit difficult to understand into a really easy to use tool. And so now you don't, so now you can just install the firmware uh, that you need pretty easily. Um, I did want to mention that before I rewrote it, um, the firmware update man page, the fw underscore update man page was in section one. So if you type man fw update, and you get the one in section one. You want to delete that, and you might also want to look at sysclean. It's a package that helps clean all that stuff uh, up. In any case, that initial version of firmware update um, was run during the rc.first time script. And OpenBSD uses a shell-based RC system uh, for startup. And the rc.first time script is generally created by the installer. But it, it, you know it's just a pretty standard thing, and anybody could create one if they needed it. But uh, what happens with it is that if it exists, the RC system runs that script, and then after it's finished, it deletes it so it won't run again. Um, and the installer would dump the, a command to run for more update into that uh, RC.first time script. So after you've installed and you reboot, uh, at startup time, the system would automatically run this script for you and install that firmware that uh, wasn't part of the base system if you had networking and all these other uh, things. But if you did the install, you probably have networking, hopefully. Anyway, that means that most of the time after you would reboot and it would install that firmware and then you could reboot again and the kernel would have the firmware up available and the uh, X windows that you said, I want to run that on boot, would suddenly run the second time. So the next step, in, in uh, the next bit of uh, improvement to those, uh, that the firmware update tool, was integrating it more tightly into the package system. And the OpenBSD package tools are written in Perl. Um, and one reason for this is because Perl is really good at dealing with the mess that humans make. Um, things like version numbers and dependencies and things like that. Um, it is entirely possible, uh, I think highly, highly improbable, that that will change and be written in something else, but I've been surprised. Um, so in uh, around 2015, Mark Espy, who's the kind of main author of most of the package tools, um, embedded that firmware update logic into the package system itself, uh, rewriting that kind of little shell wrapper that just called package add into the Perl, into uh, Perl. And with that, we could provide a better user experience. Um, one example of that is that it could register uh, firmware as being firmware. And so the main, if you call the package tools as package, as package add, uh, they could ignore those firmware packages. Um, a common way of doing OpenBSD the upgrades that uh, used to be more be necessary to make sure everything was kind of clean and everything went well, but has since been uh, is no longer necessary. But people sometimes still do it. Is to uh, export the list of manually installed packages, uninstall everything, upgrade the system, reinstall that list of packages. Um, if you did that with the, these firmware update, firmware packages, it would delete those firmware packages, and suddenly your system would no longer have firmware packages, maybe for your wireless card that you then needed to do the update to the next version of OpenBSD. But now that the package tools could refuse to do that, you could delete the, all the packages, and it would just say, oh, if you want to delete these firmware packages, you have to uh, use the firmware update tool to do that. And because 
that tool ran as part of RC dot first time and stuff like that, it most a lot of people didn't necessarily know that it actually existed, right? They didn't it it, it installed these packages and they kind of knew it was there, but it wasn't forefront in their mind possibly. And so it was less surprising that uh, to people when all of a sudden their system didn't work anymore um, because they uninstalled packages. So as you see, kind of shortly before the end of 32-bit time T, uh, we're due for another rewrite. Um, I'm hoping that that actually is just deleting the whole thing because um, manufacturers have decided that they want to provide nice, like nicely licensed firmware that we're allowed to just put all that firmware into the base system. But somehow I doubt that's the case. So now we're kind of to the present time and this problem that we're trying to solve with uh, getting rid of that extra reboot. And so since we're not allowed to include that firmware in the base install, all uh, base sets on the install, but we need it as the kernel is starting on that first boot, there's not really any space in between uh, those two that, that we have control to be able to install that firmware, except kind of at the tail end of the installer script. And so that's where we kind of have to do it. Um, there's not really a better place. So what is, how is the OpenBSD installer built? Well, it's kind of a live system, um, but it's a really stripped down live system with just enough tools really to do the install with a couple of things in there. Uh, for system recovery. Um, and that generally means that if you uh, have broken your system somehow, usually that ends up being I edited a file in Etsy that I shouldn't have. Um, and so the system won't boot. You can use the install kernel uh, to boot up and mount the file systems and do some system recovery as necessary. Um, however, that uh, install media is pretty limited. Um, because several of our architectures that we support uh, have installers that fit on a floppy disk still. And Perl does not fit on a floppy disk. <clears throat> even by itself, not you know, even with it, not with the other rest of the tools that are already there. Um, and we can't trust that the kernel, the installer's kernel, hasn't had any changes uh, to the destination kernel. And so they might be out of sync. And so the Perl that we're installing might be out of sync from the installer kernel. Or maybe it just has things compiled out because we compile a lot of things out of that install kernel that aren't needed, like graphics drivers and stuff, to save space to fit it on a floppy. Um, and so uh, this is why we can't use Perl to, we can't use that Perl version of firmware update. And so we have to do something else. And one of the things we could do is you know, throw out all those floppy disks, but choosing not to add complexity where it's not needed and keeping those limitations um, is one of the reasons that OpenBSD has, in my opinion, one of the best installers of any OS. Um, you know, if you're not careful, uh, you might end up with an installer that you can't use, that, that doesn't work over a serial console. Um, or maybe it takes more than 10 minutes and a couple of the dozen questions that are mostly just uh, default answer is perfect um, to get a system installed and running. And OpenBSD doesn't have that. And this is one of my favorite things about OpenBSD and kind of why I wanted to give this talk is they, people on, in the project think about whether a feature outweighs the complexity that, uh, that is required to implement that feature. Um, and even better, uh, complexity is removed or uh, hidden where it's possible. Um, for example, when adding a new kernel feature, sometimes it's unclear whether the uh, what the right setting is uh, for a particular value. And a lot of those things would be normally become syscontrols in uh, the syscontrol interface. And there's a lot of thought put into, well, can we figure out how not to do that. Um, you know, is there a way to make this 
value auto tune? Is there a way to uh, make this value depend on another value? Can we just really pick the best value that works for most people? And sometimes that's not known at the beginning, and the sys control gets added. But over time, people look at those sys controls and say, hey, you know what? Nobody ever changes this value, or everybody always changes it to this value, or it works best depending on the amount of memory we have, and so it scales based on the amount of memory in the system. And so you can get rid of that sys control, and that happens a lot. Making these interfaces really simpler, uh, much simpler, improves the user experience for, of OpenBSD. Um, sometimes removing complexity isn't necessarily a user experience uh, improvement. Um, for example, we used to have a Bluetooth stack uh, in OpenBSD a long time ago, but it was uh, not being well maintained, and a lot of it didn't support a lot of the new devices that were coming out, and nobody was really interested in. Uh, adding support and making it, bringing it up to date. And so instead, it was just completely ripped out and removed because that complexity of that stack wasn't providing the utility of only supporting the, these old devices but not any of the new ones. And so at the moment, OpenBSD doesn't have any Bluetooth support, which means it doesn't work for everyone, but it doesn't have that complexity that was pretty much useless because uh, nobody was stepping up to it. Uh, maintain it. And for some people that's a deal breaker, but um, not for everyone. You can get, a, if you want to have a wireless keyboard or mouse, you can usually get a USB dongle that will talk to the device, or uh, Bluetooth headphones can often talk to a USB dongle, that sort of thing. And you can work around some of these limitations in other ways if you need them, but a lot of people don't. Um, Another good example of this um, is we used to have uh, Apache version 1 in the base system as a web server. Uh, and it was kind of getting old and not well maintained upstream because Apache version 2 was out. But Apache version 2 was licensed under the Apache 2 license. And that was a little too uh, complicated for OpenBSD to be comfortable with importing. And so about that same time, Nginx was kind of becoming a thing. And so OpenBSD said, oh, Open Nginx has a better license, a more, uh, more acceptable license than Apache version 2, so we'll import Nginx. And um, thanks to Brian Nadat, because he reminded me of uh, the whole Nginx thing, because I'd totally forgotten. Um, and, but it was in there for about three releases, because every release and multiple times in between a release, they'd import new versions of Nginx and just lots and lots more code because Nginx was trying to be everything to everyone. If you had a use case for a web server, Nginx wanted to support it. And that's a great goal to have, but it's not an OpenBSD goal. And so uh, over time, I am pretty quickly, uh, OpenBSD realized that that wasn't uh, something that was acceptable, was some, wasn't something they wanted in the base system. And so uh, somebody was able to convince Reich to write a small, minimal HTTP daemon. And so we have an OpenBSD HTTPD uh, in the base system that has a lot, lot, lot fewer uh, features than Nginx. But it works for a lot of people. It does have support for uh, fast CGI and it supports for rewrites and things like that. So it works in a lot of use cases, but you know, if you have use cases that it doesn't support, or if uh, you're if if you're using software that doesn't isn't easily configured with it, you can always package add Nginx and use that. This same sort of thing happened shortly thereafter with sudo. Sudo used to be Upstream OpenBSD used to be the source of sudo, but the same thing was happening. Sudo was trying to be everything for everyone. Lots and lots of uh, additional features getting added all the time, adding complexity, and things that OpenBSD didn't need as part of the base system. And so Ted Uat wrote Do As, which is a much simpler tool to do those 
particular parts of that, that sudo used to do that OpenBSD needs as part of the base system. Again, if you need those more complicated features, then you can package add sudo and still use that. And uh, Miller T still uh, maintains that outside of OpenBSD, and he's still an OpenBSD developer. But OpenBSD looks at where they can remove complexity because it's not generally useful and makes the system simpler. One last example of that is the recent addition of uh, full disk encryption support to the OpenBSD installer. Um, for a long time, you could do a full disk encrypted uh, OpenBSD install, but you had to pre-encrypt the disk and then you could run the OpenBSD install on top of the encrypted disk. It was kind of a pain. There was a there were instructions on how to do it. Um, but uh, KNAT a couple of releases ago added first passphrase support, so you could encrypt your to full disk with the passphrase, and then shortly after uh, added key disk support. Um, you do have to prepare your key disk outside of the installer, but uh, that's a lot simpler than all of the other steps that you had to do to pre-encrypt a disk. Um, the amount of time spent discussing what the questions in the installer would look like and what they would be and how they would be asked was significantly longer and more drawn out than the actual implementation discussion um, because there's so much care about that the user uh, experience using OpenBST even in the installer. A recent commit by Ingo Schwarzy uh, kind of implies this attitude of simplicity and not ha trying to provide everything to everyone. You're not supposed to commit infinite numbers of items, but correctness is a virtue. OpenBSD is not here to be everything for everyone. Instead, it tries to stay as simple as possible while meeting the needs of the developers and as many people as they can. All right, let's get back on track. Fortunately, the OpenBSD package uh, format is pretty simple. It's used the one that's used by the firmware packages, same as everything else. Um, it's nearly just tarballs. Unfortunately, it's not quite just downloading and extracting a tarball. Um, and as you may have inferred, uh, up until this point, that Perl package manager uh, was the only thing that actually dealt with the package database and OpenBSD. And we can't use that. But at least we don't have to um, deal with multiple users when we're in the installer because there's only one person installing. Um, fortunately, there's some things that have not yet been removed from OpenBSD and are actually part of the install media. Um, and that gives us some pretty impressive capabilities. I mean, the OpenBSD, this installer, is written with these tools that installs the whole system and it fits on a floppy disk. And those same tools gave us enough features uh, to be able to implement a very simple uh, package system client. Um, unfortunately, that was capable, possible because we were able to declare that two things uh, for the firmware. First off was no uh, dependency handling. No firmware could depend on another thing to be installed other than the base system. Um, and we would do no parsing of version numbers. We wouldn't care. We wouldn't check to see, oh, is there a newer version of firmware available. No, externally we just provide a single version of firmware for each OpenBSD release. And if the one that's installed on the system doesn't match, well, you install the other one. It doesn't matter if the version is bigger or smaller. It doesn't know. It just knows it's different. And because of those two limitations, we don't need 99 plus percent of the complexity of a package manager. And pro tip, never write a package manager. That long tail of complexity of dealing with people is infinite. So now the firmware update tool is, again, a shell script. And that means it's just a plain text file. And so we don't actually have to include it on the install media um, because KSH, OpenBSD's shell, is on the uh, install media, it can interpret this firmware update script that's been installed as part of the base system. 
and that means we can we don't have to worry so much about uh, bloating that script and we can write the it in a little better or a little uh, nicer style that I prefer to the very terse style that the install scripts are written in to save space. One last feature that we needed uh, to actually make this work on the installer or in the installer was that, like I said, not all drivers are compiled into the install kernel to save space. Um, but the installer no but but during build at build time, we know what things the driver is going to or the kernel is going to print into the D message, even if it doesn't attach any drivers to it. And so Theo and Arnagiat uh, wrote a wrote some C that looks at uh, PCI devs data header and the dev specific dev list headers and figures out what is going to appear in the um, D message so that we can map that back to the device or to the driver, which we can then map back to the firmware that is needed. Um, so rather than having you know a dozen or so, uh, maybe two dozen uh, driver names that need firmware, we now have like 600 and something lines of uh, matches that we need to match. But we can do that. So. The tools kind of that, that we use uh, as part of this firmware update is, of course, KSH, which is um, an open, the OpenBSD shell, or one of the OpenBSD shells that ships with OpenBSD and it comes in the installer. Um, it's really pretty powerful. You can do bitwise calculations in it, and it has integers. Um, I wrote a, I've written a script that can do IPv6 manipulation of IPv6 addresses in pure KSH, no external uh, programs. Of course, it only has 32-bit integers, so you have to split up the v6 address into four pieces and do carrying between them to do math on them, but you can do it. These firmware patterns that I mentioned are actually FN match uh, globs that KSH can match directly. Um, my uh, initial implementation shelled out to an external program. I think it was said that uh, to do the matching, and it was really slow. Um, as an example, I have a 166 megahertz uh, alpha machine uh, with 128 megs of memory that someone in the room bestowed upon me. Um, and it would take several minutes uh, to do this detection process. And with that, using that machine as my test bed, I was able to optimize this, and now it only takes a few seconds uh, to run on that machine, and it's almost instantaneous on most modern machines. However, KSH, of course, still can't pass around arbitrary strings and stuff. And another limitation is that there's no networking in the shell, which shells probably shouldn't have networking support, right? I'm sure that anybody who would put a shell a network into a shell is really just a ghost story put there to scare me. <clears throat> Instead, we have FTP. And well, on OpenBSD, FTP, the FTP client uh, grew support for HTTP GET and TLS, so it can do H FTP over TLS and HTTP GET over TLS. Um, and although uh, FTP is using Pledge and Unveil, which are uh, some sandboxing type uh, tools that OpenBSD provides that if you want more information, there's stuff on the OpenBSD website and talks on YouTube and stuff about those. But it's still an older code base that talks to the network. And we don't really trust it that much. Um, there's also an unfinished uh, HTTP client that get pa gets passed around. Uh, it was written by Sue Neal at. Um, but it is still missing some features or had some bugs or something that haven't quite been worked out yet. So we're still stuck with um, this old FTP. So instead of just trusting it, uh, we drop privileges while we're running it and run it as an unprivileged user. And we actually use uh, either SU or DOAS to do that. Um, SU was too big to fit on the uh, install media. And so it was easier to compile down, compile out features of DOAS. And so DOAS is a on the, on the install media is a really stripped down version. And really, all it does is let uh, 
really exact other exact programs as other users. Um, and, and that's about it. When you're running on the in a regular system, normally do as looks at a config file that doesn't exist in, in the default install. And if there's no config file, it, does, it refuses to do anything. Uh, so firmware update can't use do as because well, it doesn't work uh, unless you've configured it. Or if you did configure it, if we did add a like, default config for firmware update to work, well, somebody else could go in and edit that config and make it stop working. And that would be kind of surprising. So instead on the full system, we use SU, which doesn't have that uh, limitation of or using a config file, it just pretty much lets you, lets root do whatever they want. And so we can download the file, talk to the network as a lower privileged user uh, before handing the file to root. And we can verify that the firmware is signed and trusted before you doing, uh, using it. Um, so in OpenBSD, the web of trust kind of thing is done with Signify, which is an OpenBSD tool. And it uses these short keys. Um, these are the public keys for uh, OpenBSD 7.5. And the way that the trust works is that you can see, find this key in all sorts of places. Uh, it's here on my slides. It's on the OpenBSD website. It's in the announcement email for the release. It's in the OpenBSD CVS repository. It's in the OpenBSD GitHub mirror of that CVS repository. It's in a lot of places that you can look and see that it's there, it's on the OpenBST website. Um, and so you can look and verify that, oh, it matches in all these places, that's the one. So then you can get that uh, key, verify the installer uh, that you've downloaded or that you've downloaded from the OpenBST is the is assigned installer. And if it's been, if that signature matches, uh, then you can know that that installer was put there by someone that the OpenBSD project trusts with the private keys to assign those. Um, a little more detail on that is that uh, what actually happens is, is, is a SHA-256 SHA checksum file is generated, and then that checksum file is signed. And so we can verify the signature, or the checksums of all of the files that we're going to install. Uh, once we verify that the signature on the checksum file is correct. That's pretty much the same way it works with the firmware. We have a SHA-256 that's signed of the firmware using this firmware key. Um, and that firmware key, um, well, that the base key is not only something you can download and verify the uh, installer set with, it's embedded in that installer. So when the installer downloads and installs the OpenBSD base sets, it also verifies the signatures of those sets that it downloads and installs. And inside of one of those uh, sets is the firmware public key and also ports public keys and some other things, uh, including the public keys for the next release. So it'll have the OpenBSD 7.6 keys in there. So when you go to upgrade, it automatically has the keys available to verify the next version of OpenBSD. Um, and so we can use that firmware public key to verify the SHA-256 for the firmware, and then we can download the firmware and check the SHA-256 checksum of that firmware against what's in the file and verify that whatever this firmware is, is what somebody that OpenBSD trusted with the firmware pr private key said what should be in there. <coughs> One of the most useful things for system recovery on the installer is Ed. Um, and really, it was used to just be there for system recovery. Um, but because the package database is actually a text-based uh, database, we use Ed to script um, registering the firmware with uh, the package database. And I know that I said that we don't use Perl anymore. Uh, but that's not entirely true. Uh, when we're running multi-user, we need to uh, be a little more careful because somebody could running package add and somebody could be running for a more update and somebody could be running another copy of package add. And those could conflict and cause uh, problems in the, uh, cause corruption in the package database. 
And so we use Perl, the same code to lock the database so that only one uh, process can modify it at a time. And with all of that, we're able to run for more update during the install. Um, we actually run it a lot, just in case. Um, during install or upgrade, no, installer, we run it. Those are both pretty much the same script. Um, if you're using sysupgrade, which I recommend, uh, we run it before rebooting. Um, and it installs the firmware for the destination system that you're installing to, so that the installer, which is in sync with that destination system, can use that firmware if it needs it to start to load a wireless driver or something. Um, and after install, we continue to run it as part of RC.first time in case there was something that the firmware patterns missed or the network wasn't working right or something. But most of the time, nearly 850 lines of KSH later, you no longer have to reboot yet again after installing before X will start. And it's been doing that since OpenBSD 7.1 a couple of years ago. Uh, the FAQ does have a section about adding extra firmware to the installer in case you need to install using a wireless card that needs a firmware and you kind of have this chicken and egg problem. You can get that firmware somewhere else and inject it into the installer and the installer can use it. And that's on the OpenBSD website. Um, and with that, thanks. Um, one last thing. If you're here around Portland, uh, hit me up. We're, we do a social meetup at bst.pizza uh, every month. Um, and we just get together and talk about BST stuff over, you know, food and drink of your choice, generally at a pizza-ish place. Um, Michael Dexter over here organizes Plug, the Portland Linux Unix group, every month. And they're a little more structured. They actually have people give real talks and things. Um, both of these meetings are posted on calligator.org pretty regularly, the Portland Tech Calendar Aggregator. So if you're looking for something to do in Portland, uh, that's a good place to look. <clears throat> and I probably can answer questions until somebody comes in and kicks us out. Yes, Dexter. It's orthogonal, but could you describe your native distance vector? Um, no, I don't remember how it works. Uh, I I know that they regularly change the number of uh, rounds that it uses to encrypt things. But how did they inject that? Um, so under UFS, the soft raid files, the soft raid system has a encryption algorithm in it, a layer in it. And so it can, uh, use, it provides, presents a disk layer on top of a disk layer that has encryption in the middle. <laughs>